Something bad has happened to you at work. You think some employment laws have been broken and you don't want to stay there anymore. So you quit your job and call a lawyer. This video answers one big question. If you quit your job, should you sue your former employer for employment violations that happened while you were working? The honest answer to this question is it's complicated. So keep watching because I'm going to explain what a constructive termination is and when you should pursue legal action even though you quit. This is the second video in a two-part series. The first video covered the legal ramifications of quitting your job. And in that video, I explained that even if you have a good case, quitting your job can dramatically reduce the value of your lawsuit. Why? Well, generally, if you quit your job, the law does not allow you to recover your lost wages. But you are entitled to recover them when you're fired. I'll put a link to that video at the end of this one, and I highly recommend that you watch it if you haven't already. So generally, when people quit, the value of their case is smaller. But I said that there was a big exception to that rule. That's if your resignation would qualify as a constructive termination, constructive discharge. If that happens, you can still recover your lost wages. But before we get into all the juicy details, we need to quickly cover three things. Number one, when it comes to workplace activities, there's a significant difference between things that are unfair and things that are illegal. For the rest of this video, I am going to presume that you have suffered from illegal activities at work, and had you been fired, you could have brought a wrongful termination claim. Now this is a big assumption to make, as whether or not the law was broken is an enormous subject unto itself. I make this presumption to help facilitate our learning about constructive termination. Number two, I practice employment law in California. That is where I have a license to practice law. But this video isn't just for folks in California, it's for all people across the United States. Because most of what I talk about here is similar from state to state. When I'm citing to California law specifically, I will tell you. However, this video is not legal advice for your situation. You should never take what is said on a YouTube video as legal advice. If you need legal advice, you need to call a lawyer in your state. Number three, if you've been the victim of intolerable working conditions, please share your story in the comment section down below and describe how it turned out. Obviously, don't put any identifying or sensitive information, but by putting your story out there, other people can learn from your experience, they can learn from your mistakes, or they can take inspiration from how you dealt with the situation. Okay, let's get back to the whiteboard and let's get into the details. So what is a constructive termination? Constructive termination is when an employee is effectively fired even though they, in reality, quit or resigned. So if you meet all the elements of the test, uh, the law will treat you as if you were fired. And as we discussed earlier, this is a really big deal because it affects the value of your case dramatically. As a quick review, when you sue your employer, the law generally allows you to recover three types of damages. Number one, emotional distress damages. These are the monetary damages for the emotional distress that you are suffering as a result of the unlawful activity. Obviously, these are difficult to estimate and value. Number two, punitive damages. Everybody's heard about these. These are the damages meant to punish the employer for engaging in malice, fraud, or oppression. These are very hard to win in employment cases. And number three, economic damages, often called your lost wages. These are the most important, and these damages are why the entire body of constructive discharge law even exists. So what are lost wages? Well, 
Let's say you are making $50,000 a year and you get fired illegally. If you were out of work for an entire year, you lost $50,000 due to the illegal termination. Those are your lost wages. They're easy to understand, they're easy to calculate. Okay, so to be clear, if you quit and it was not a constructive termination, the law prohibits you from recovering your lost wages. If you quit and it was a constructive termination, the law allows you to recover your lost wages. If you're fired illegally, the law allows you to recover your lost wages. So if you quit and you want to sue your former employer or boss, you want your termination to be classified as a constructive termination. All right, let's get into constructive termination law. What does the law say in this area? Okay, to establish a constructive discharge claim, an employee must prove, quote, that the employer either intentionally created or knowingly permitted working conditions that were so intolerable or aggravated at the, at the time of the employee's resignation that a reasonable employer would realize that a reasonable person in the employee's position would be compelled to resign. That's from Turner v. Anheuser-Busch. This is a famous California case that applies to California employees. However, most states have something similar. So to qualify as a constructive termination in California, the test has four elements that must be met. Number one, the working conditions must be intolerable or aggravated. What does that mean? All right, let's talk about intolerable first. Well, the traditional definition of intolerable is that you're unable to endure something. The jury instructions in California, they say the opposite. They say trivial, trivial acts are insufficient. That comes from Cassie 2432, I think. Usually this means that a continuous pattern of objectionable conduct has taken place. Now, obviously this is difficult to meet. So let's give you an example. For example, let's say you complain about unlawful discrimination and then your employer just stops paying you. He doesn't tell you, he just stops you know, direct depositing your paychecks. Your employer hasn't fired you and you keep showing up for work week after week. After several paychecks simply fail to show up, you quit. Would this be considered intolerable? I think so because it's a continuous pattern of objectionable conduct that clearly nobody would put up with. But like I said, this test is very difficult to meet. Uh, for example, let's go through some things that, that illustrate this. An employee is not permitted to quit and sue simply because he or she does not like their new job assignment. Uh, another example is an employee may not be unreasonably sensitive to his or her working environment because every job has its frustrations, challenges, and disappointments. Uh, here's a few more examples of things that courts have definitively found do not meet the intolerable test. Uh, one case said that severe verbal abuse of employees, such as harsh or unfair criticism, in front of other employees, and even threats to terminate them, are not considered intolerable working conditions. Yes. Uh, there's, a, you know, sometimes that can still meet the test if there's a continuous course of such conduct though. In another case, a poor performance rating or even a demotion, even when, even when accompanied by a pay cut, did not constitute intolerable working conditions. The existence of, say, illegal conduct in the workplace may not by itself be intolerable. However, I think if your boss asks you to commit a serious crime in retaliation for something, like something that you engaged in that was protected, and you refuse to do it and quit, I think a court and a jury would find that to be intolerable. All right, let's talk about aggravated, because this is also very important. Generally, aggravated means to make something worse, right? Make an injury worse. Well, single or isolated acts are generally insufficient to prove something is aggravated. But in some cases, even a single incident may be held to be aggravated if it's serious enough. 
For example, a crime of violence against the employee or an ultimatum that the employee committed crime. The court might consider that to be aggravated. All right, that's the first part. Second, your employer knowingly created, knew about, or permitted the intolerable acts. The employer must have intentionally created the intolerable conditions. Remember from this case up here? They had to have had actual knowledge of them, or at a minimum, the employer had to knowingly permit the intolerable conditions. As one case put it, the employer must either deliberately create the intolerable working conditions that trigger the resignation, or at a minimum, must know about them and fail to remedy the situation. That's pretty serious. So the employer must know about it. The third element of the test is the intolerable conditions left you, the employee, with no reasonable choice but to resign. This is pretty clear cut. You have to show that the reason you quit was the intolerable conditions and not something else. This is not as easy as it sounds. Number four, had you been fired, you would have to show that you had grounds to bring a wrongful termination claim. Obviously, this is a huge topic unto itself. I've made several videos about wrongful termination law, so if you're interested, I recommend you watch them. I'll put links to all of them down below. I have three in particular that you should watch. The first is on wrongful termination law. The second is on what to expect in a wrongful termination lawsuit. And the third, probably one most people want to learn about, is how much money a wrongful termination case is worth. I recommend you watch all of those. Quick interruption, if this video has been helpful so far, can you do me a quick favor and hit the like button? It's free to do so, and if you do, the litigation gods will smile upon you and your case will automatically be worth a million dollars. Obviously, I'm kidding, but I appreciate the fact that you're taking the time to educate yourself, even if it does mean watching a video that's this long. Anyway, keep watching. All right, let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of constructive termination cases. Well, the clear advantage of these cases is that the law will treat you as if you were fired and you can win your lost wages. I mean, that's amazing. I mean, you quit and you can still win your lost wages. But even though that's a great, there are three enormous disadvantages. Number one, constructive termination cases are extremely difficult to win. Judges and juries absolutely hate these cases. And if you think about it, it'll make sense. Look, you quit your job, but you're asking the court to award you lost wages. The natural reaction to a scenario like that is, well, it's your fault. You shouldn't have quit your job. Even with great, intolerable facts, as we've talked about before, even good attorneys have difficulty overcoming this inherent bias. Number two, settlement value is generally less. When negotiating a constructive termination case, there will always be some sort of discount due to the uncertainty around economic damages. The defense lawyers are going to argue that you won't win them even if you win the liability portion of your case. To get top dollar, your lawyer is going to have to argue convincingly that you're not only going to win the liability section of your case, but you're also going to win your claim for constructive dismissal. It's just another hurdle that you have to win. And number three, and this one's very important, it's very difficult to find a good employment lawyer to take constructive termination cases. Okay, let's talk about the reality of finding a good employment lawyer for constructive termination cases. Believe it or not, even though it seems like there's lawyers everywhere, there is an attorney shortage across the country. And employment law is especially hot right now. The demand for my services far outstrips my working capacity by an order of magnitude. I mean, my office gets thousands of calls a year. I can't handle it, but a small fraction of that. Now, what is important to know about lawyers in this area of law is each case we take comes with a very high opportunity cost. If an attorney takes your case, that means he or she can't take somebody else's case. We only have so many hours in the day so your case must, by its very nature, be better than the other cases the attorney is considering at that time. In essence, 
At the intake stage, you're competing with other people for that attorney's attention. Now, this is especially important because of how employment lawyers get paid. Now, most employees who just quit their job or got fired cannot afford to hire a lawyer and pay hundreds of dollars an hour out of pocket for legal representation. That's why in employment law, the reputable lawyers who help employees all do it on a contingency fee. That means that we get paid a percentage of what we recover for our clients. Um, and that percentage is usually between 35 to 45% of the gross recovery. The advantage of a contingency fee is that clients don't have to pay their attorney anything up front or out of pocket. The attorney is in essence partnering with you in the hopes that they will eventually get paid something worthwhile. It's a win-win fee arrangement. But the attorney is taking significant risk. The attorney will spend thousands of dollars on the case. More importantly, the attorney will probably put in hundreds, maybe thousands of hours of time into the case. And this becomes especially important because the attorney never knows how long the case will take. It might take five months or five years. You never know at the start of the case. And remember, there's an opportunity cost to each case. If I'm working on your case, that means I'm not working on somebody else's. With a fee structure like that, it should become obvious that the case must be valuable enough to make the pursuit of justice worthwhile for both you, the client, and your attorney. And the sad reality of today's situation and the, the attorney shortage is that there are so many good cases out there where people got fired illegally. With that many good wrongful termination cases floating around, it makes it really hard for a good lawyer to justify taking on a constructive discharge case. But with that said, I've taken constructive termination cases. I've taken them in the past, and I'm certain I'll take some in the future. And let me give you an example of a case I handled a number of years ago. Uh, my client, who was older, worked at a veterinary office for over, I think it was over 15 years. The office hired a few younger individuals who liked to tease my client because of her age. The teasing slowly turned into bullying, which eventually turned into outright harassment. It escalated so much that they would sneak up behind her and wrap a, wrap a dog leash around her neck and pull it tight so she couldn't breathe. They would sneak up behind her with a plastic bag and put it over her head while she was working. Now that's shocking, right? It's intolerable, right? Yeah, she complained about it repeatedly, but management did nothing. So she quit and hired me. And thankfully, I was able to get her a settlement that she was very happy with. Well, okay, Brannigan. But how much are these cases worth? That's a great question. And it's a loaded question. And it takes a lot of work to answer honestly. Luckily, I've already made a video about how much these cases are worth. So if you want to answer that question, you need to watch my video called How Much Money Are Wrongful Termination Cases Worth? Because a winning constructive termination case becomes essentially a wrongful termination case. Okay, that was a lot of information. My brain hurts and I bet yours does as well. But I get asked about this so often, I wanted to take a lot of time to explain constructive termination law and the realities of it so I can help as many people as possible. Now, if you're in California and you believe you have a great constructive termination case, don't be afraid to call my office if you feel like I've earned your phone call. Here is my contact information. Now, if you're outside of California, please call a lawyer in your state. I thank you for watching. I hope this was very helpful, and I pray that you have a wonderful day. Take care.